It's called Vedic Astrology, so obviously it's supposed to have something to do with the Vedas. But what are the Vedas? Let's talk about that. Most of the time, most people think that the Vedas are books, books of wisdom from India. But the truth is that the Vedas are no more books than music is a bunch of ones and zeros in an MP3 file. Now, just as the MP3 file for your favorite song is pretty damn important, similarly, the books and the, and the exact language used in those books is pretty damn important to the Vedas, yet the essential thing to understand is they are not the Vedas themselves. Okay, so then what are the Vedas? The Vedas are a transmission of knowledge. Now, at this point, it'd be very, very prudent to ask, what's knowledge? We're not talking about math, reading, writing, arithmetic, that kind of stuff. Here, the word knowledge means the ability to know, the ability to experience something is knowledge. You know something by experiencing it. So knowledge is a accurate perception of reality. It's very important to understand this definition of knowledge when you get into terms like vidya and avidya, which you'll encounter right away as you start to study Vedic thinking. Vidya means knowledge and avidya means ignorance. But ignorance here really means not that you don't know something, but that your perception of something is skewed, misaligned, distorted, not sincere or true to what it actually is. And vidya means perceiving it accurately, perceiving it as it truly is. So the Vedas are a transmission of empowerment to be able to perceive and interact with the world as it truly is. Coming back to the concept that the Vedas are books. The Vedas are not books, they're knowledge. But knowledge is transmitted in the f through language. Various types of language, not every language has to be verbal, but primarily language is verbal. Words are the vehicle for transmitting knowledge. Sometimes words get written down so that they can be more easily remembered, preserved, and passed on. Today we have some of the Vedas. Not all of the Vedas continue to exist, but we have some of the Vedas in written form. This written form dates back to approximately 5,000 years ago. So we don't have the misconception that every Veda was put into written form 5,000 years ago. Roughly 5,000 years ago is when the process began. And the Vedas are not static entirely. Not they have a static core, but they have a dynamic, adaptive tellability to them. And so, especially in the sections of the Vedas known as the Puranas, there's a great deal of tellability. So Puranas can be linguistically dated much later because they were evolving through telling. The core, their cores were evolving through telling over many centuries. So many of the Puranas, are the oldest forms of them, can be linguistically dated to about 1,300 years ago. So in any case, these are very, very ancient books of wisdom recorded in words. Now, where did these words come from? They were put into a written form by someone named Vyas, which literally means an editor or an assembler. Vyas originated some of the texts, in fact, some of the very, very important texts, because instead of just copying words that were spoken before, he actually edited them and reassembled them into a format that would work better in written. So he created uh, three very important works, which are practically speaking the most famous Vedas in this day and age. The Mahabharata, you may not have heard of that book, but you probably have definitely heard of the Gita, Bhagavad Gita. That's a chapter in the Mahabharata. He also composed something called Vedanta Sutra, which is a summary of the philosophical points in the Vedas. 
you may have heard of that one, you may not, because it's more philosophical. It's not very uh, mainstream. And then, because it was so unmainstream, he actually made a third book, which was halfway between Mahabharata, which is very storytelling type thing, and uh, Vedanta Sutra, which is very philosophical. He made something called the Bhagavata Purana, or he revised the uh, Bhagavata Purana very greatly. So he composed uh, this new version of Bhagavad Purana, which is called Srimad Bhagavatam. And those three books are essential, absolutely essential in this epoch, in this day and age, to understand the Vedas. If you read other Vedas without reading these three, you'll be mystified and come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. But if you study these three very carefully, the Bhagavad Purana, Vedanta Sutra, and Gita, or Mahabharata, you'll be able to possibly make perfect sense out of the Vedas. The simplest one of all to study is the Gita, because it's the shortest, the most condensed. And the most thorough one is the Vedanta Sutra, but it's the most abstract. So the, the best perfect balance between the two is the Bhagavad Purana. But definitely entry place to study Vedic thought is Bhagavad Gita. I made a translation of Bhagavad Gita. It's called A Simple Gita. Yeah, and I also have translations of the first three segments of the Bhagavad Purana, which you can also find on Amazon.com. I'll put links to these books in the description. Prior to Vyas making these three great texts, the Vedas existed in spoken form. Where did those words come from? They came from different sages, great men and women of Vedic culture who experienced reality very, very, very directly and clearly and harmonious with its true nature and then expressed it. But how were they able to have a very, very accurate perception of reality? After all, that's what the Veda is supposed to give. The words of the Vedas actually originate in the original life form. The original life form in, the, in a universe is Brahma. Still, we have the question of how did Brahma get his accurate experience of reality? This story is very interesting, but Brahma actually tried to uh, research. When, when he manifest or woke up in the universe, he looked around and tried to figure out where the hell he was and what was going on. And he made great efforts over a great deal of time to try to explore the universe and figure out what it was and what he was and what his place was. And he couldn't. And he kept coming up against a wall that he couldn't get beyond. He couldn't go past a certain point in his exploration. And he began to get tired and fatigued from that effort. And this really alarmed him greatly because he realized that he was not immortal. He had a certain amount of energy and not more. So he decided that he would take a different approach rather than trying to explore the universe through his senses. He went back to his origin point, which was the, uh, a flower and just tried to calm himself down by breathing and focus his mind inward. And this is the origin of all the yoga disciplines. And by doing so, he clarified his mind and was able to go past his mind, look through his mind to see what's behind or beyond or deeper than the mind. And there he was able to have an audience or a darshan with the source of his being. Each one of us is an individual being but each one of us has a source of being. That source of being is the super being, the super consciousness it's called Vishnu. Now, Vishnu is different from Brahma because Brahma was a product generated in the universe, but Vishnu is not the product. Vishnu is the substrata or the foundation which generates the universe. Vishnu is the fundamental consciousness at the root of everything. He inherently has an accurate perception of reality because he generates it. So Vishnu inherently has Vidya. Vishnu inherently has Veda. Veda eternally exists in Vishnu. And when Brahma had darshan with Vishnu, Vishnu transmitted, empowered Brahma to be able to have that same perception of reality that Vishnu has. And that process of empowering an individual to be able to experience the thing that you experience is called... Param para. Param para means when the param, the thing which is superior, empowers the para, the thing which is inferior, to be, come to its position. So Vishnu 
already had the perfect perception of reality and he empowered Brahma, who didn't have it, to be able to get it. Then Brahma, who then becomes like Vishnu, he's got a, an accurate perception of reality as Vidya or Veda. And now he can try to transmit it to others. He can try to continue the parampara. And that's what he did by putting it into words. So from Vishnu to Brahma, from Brahma to his offspring, from them to their offspring, all the way down eventually into human beings, to Vyas, who condenses everything and makes it accessible to us in our modern age in a written form, down to Amazon.com where you can go and get a book that I translated. That is what the Vedas actually are. They're a communication through words intended to empower us to be able to exist in reality in a nice way, in a harmonious way, in the way that we were meant to exist, in a joyful manner. So I hope that this may have clarified for you what the Vedas really are and what they're not, and may have given you uh, impetus or an inspiration to utilize the Vedas. How do you utilize the Vedas? Not just by reading them, because they're not just books, but read the Veda, deliberate on the Veda, Try to develop questions about it, patient questions, after deliberating on it clearly. And to be able to come up with those questions, you have to actually try to practice what you're reading. Try to see how it is real and how it would affect your daily life and your daily perceptions. So you read, you read for example, Bhagavad Gita and you try to act on it and see the concepts working in real life. And that's when you'll see, I can't see this. So you'll come up with a question about it. Or, hmm, I see this, but it's not quite so clear. Or, am I seeing this accurately? Or is this something else I'm seeing? And ask those questions to a person who ideally has the Veda, understands it perfectly, or at least understands it better, or more than you, in your opinion. This is the way to understand the Vedas, and you yourself become empowered to have the same experience of reality that Vishnu himself has.